Hi, it's Ed Butowski. Welcome to another edition of Making Sense. Uh, and today we have uh, kind of a, a rock star. Uh, I like to think of him. Uh, and his name is Dr. Tal Schwartz. And I want to go through an introduction and, and give it the, the emphasis that it, you know, that it not only requires, but deserves. Uh, he earned his doctorate degree in finance from Cornell and has held positions as a professor of finance, visiting scientists, and lecturer at leading universities, including Caltech, the Texion, uh, which is the Israeli Institute of Technology, DePaul University, and Tel Aviv, uh, uh, Tel Aviv University. On Wall Street, he worked as a quant at Citadel Investments. And for those of you who uh, don't know Citadel, it is the like the rock star of all hedge funds out there. I mean, if you work at Citadel and you're a quant, you are the best of the of the breed. And at at uh, Citadel, he developed and implemented AI models, trading algorithms, and portfolio optimization strategies. He also launched an AI funds with a mission uh, to lead a new era of artificial uh, managed investing. He was dissatisfied with the current state of investing and decided that he wanted to develop something that was superior, which uh, I'm very interested in. So Dr. Schwartz, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. So, so for those of you out there, I'd like you to uh, feel very free to go to your Q&A or the chat and put questions in because this is going to be full range. It's going to have a little bit of a focus on investing, uh, which makes sense because that's what I do for a living. But we're also going to talk about artificial intelligence. And the reason I reached out to Dr. Schwartz was because I was being bombarded every day. There's something new about artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm sure that those of you watching, you know, feel the same way. So I, I wanted Dr. Schwartz to kind of take us through a little bit of, you know, where artificial intelligence, why is it so mainstream right now? And, um, and then we'll dive into many different areas. So uh, Dr. Schwartz, why in the world is everything we're turning to AI these days? I think, well, I mean, really, we're in the middle of a hype cycle right now, I think is, is, is the reason. And it has to do a lot with the recent rise of ChatGPT from OpenAI. So people, if you haven't had a chance to play with it, it's a pretty incredible tool um, where you can essentially ask the ChatGPT any question, ask it to write something for you, or you write something you've written, and it does a pretty good job, much better than anything up to this point. So this has been a big hit in the last few months. It launched at the end of last year, and within a, a few months, it already has over 100 million users worldwide. And it's gotten written up in every magazine and newspaper out there. So it got a lot of attention. And as a result, AI has received a lot of attention, more so than it ever has. But you have to understand that AI is something, or machine learning, is something we've been working on for the last you know, over 50 years. The seminal paper was written by Alan Turing back in the 1950s. So it's been a process that we've built with um, you know, with Moore's law, with the fact that computing power doubles uh, very quickly over time, we've had more and more computing power. So we've been able to generate and create models that are much more sophisticated. And we can dive into what ChatGPT is exactly and what, what's been, you can say, the milestones over the last, uh, you know, 50 years or the last 20 years or so. So, so with what you are seeing out there with AI, what are some of the most interesting applications uh, that you see as you know life changing? You know, because ChatGBT, I've gone on it. I've actually written some love letters to my wife, but I uh, I wrote into the ChatGBT, write a love letter to my wife, and I sent it to her, and she kind of knew it wasn't me. Um, so that'll tell you how my love life is. But but what are some of the most interesting applications that you're seeing for AI? And and again, how is it changing the world that we live in? Okay, so first off, you have to understand we're, we're in a, a process where AI is going to become a bigger part of our life over time. And this is just the beginning, and it's getting a lot of buzz because, as you know, over many years, there's been a lot of uh, movies and, you know, a lot of uh, books written about machine, about AI, especially AI taking over the world and, and you know, destroying humanity. Uh, so, so there's a lot, a lot of stories and a lot of things in the culture around AI. 
Uh, uh, and what we're seeing now is some of those things are becoming a reality. Some of those things that used to be sci-fi are now real, right? Remember uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey and HAL and taking over the spaceship and all that. Well, now we're trying, and, and in the movie, you are talking to a computer. Well, now you can talk to a computer in real life. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So now if you think about where, how it's gonna influence our lives, ChatGPT is just the beginning. Basically what ChatGPT is, maybe we'll start with what it is. It's called a large um, language model. It's a very large model. It, it scoured and, and studied lots and lots of data or text that's written out there, uh, 37 terabytes of data. And it's been able to basically, what it can do is a predictive model where you can kind of predict what you expect, what you would like it to say. So when you write, write me a love letter, it can, it can go over all the data it has has all the connection figures, oh, if he wants a love letter, let me take all the love letters that I've ever seen and write one for him. Now, if you wrote back to him, listen, can you make this love letter more funny? Or can you make it rhyme? Or can you have it all written in A's? It will do that. It, it, it likes all the words start with A or whatever, whatever it is you ask it to do, it will try to accommodate you. Now, the chat GPT that you're using today is version 3.5. There's a new version out. It's even better. It's 4.0. That's out. Um, it's just launched actually a few days ago. And so that one is even better. And it's able to do things that the version 3.5 had a hard time doing. Now, you have to understand this is still, it's a language model. It simulates what you would like it to do. It's not conscious. It's not sentient. Even though it might seem like it, it doesn't have emotions. It might seem like it has emotions, but it doesn't. Okay. It can express them but it doesn't, it's just a model, okay? And people kind of get confused when they're talking to it. Uh, they get confused and they start thinking, well, this thing seems uh, like a real person. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we, we, we imagine that it's a real person with, with conscious, but it's not, we're not there yet. We don't have, we don't have a way of doing it, but it's, it's, it is very impressive uh, in any way. Now, what are the areas can this really, uh, where can we see it in our lives? Really pretty much every area in your life today um, uh, it could be, have play a part. Uh, so today it's already helping companies um, are using ChatGPT, integrating it with their uh, workers' workflow. Workflow, So it can help you write, write different things like proposals and letters and descriptions of products. So you see that already happening today. But over time, you'll see it more and more in many areas in our lives where, you know, if you're a lawyer and it has all the information of all the legal cases out in, uh, in it, you can ask us, can you, can you give me some examples of this versus, uh, you know, this specific case and how would you argue this and how would you do that? There's a funny story I, I, um, I heard where uh, a lady uh, who was renting a house was having a problem, uh, I forget what it was, with the window it was leaking or something. And she wrote her landlord like two or three times and he never responded. And then she went on ChatGPT and said, can you please write it in a legal way? Like the way a lawyer would write it. And she sent that to the landlord. Guess what? He was there the next day. <laughs> thought that she was about to sue him. So, so you, you know, it just it, it can imitate a lawyer and and play that role for you. For example, so that's happening today already. Now, every today there's, there's a lot of uh, fear around it because um, you can see how it can do things and potentially uh, could be harmful, like hate speech and other things. Um, so, the companies who are producing this, and right now we have the two main ones that people know of are OpenAI and Google, but you have many others that are working. Um, the, uh, it's called uh, U.com, and there's others, many others that are working on, on, on chatbots, but they're putting guardrails in there. But in my view, this is going to be integrated pretty much everywhere. Kids are going to learn with it. You're going to have like a personal coach who's going to help you study. Right now, a lot of schools are scared because it's kind of changing the way, because you could write any essay you want with it. And guess what? The teacher will never know, but will have a hard time distinguishing a real essay from one that was written by by ChatGPT, so um, because it's creating that essay for you, so it's a real problem for schools. So a lot of schools districts today banned ChatGPT, but I think that's completely the wrong thing to do. Integrate it into your school curriculum. Use it as a tool so students can learn faster and better, and have a more customized learning experience for what they need. Because every kid learns slightly differently, and you can customize it, or you, the kid could customize it to their own needs. Sort of like so that's the, just an example. It's sort of like the calculator for years. When I was in school, we never used calculators. Now every kid uses a calculator. Exactly the right analogy. That's exactly it. Right. You couldn't bring a calculator to school. It was like illegal. No, you're supposed to do arithmetic. Well, guess right. what? That's the same thing ChatGPT is today. 
and very quickly, I think it's going to be uh, probably within a year or two, or, uh, schools are going to be, no, no, you can bring ChatGPT in because, you know, it can help you study and learn better. And, and, and you know, the essay writing part, we'll figure out a way to do it so that you can, you know, practice that and learn how to do that on your own as well. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's, there's a huge promise here in pretty much every area that you can think of in your life is going to be changing with AI. Um, so, I mean, we've been promised autonomous vehicles for a while now. Uh, it's a hard problem to solve harder than we thought, but it will get solved. So we will have autonomous cars, uh, probably, I, I would, I, I'm very certain it will happen this decade. Uh, so I'm giving myself here at least seven years for it to happen, uh, but I think it will happen. I'm, I'm sure it will happen. And so, uh, so Tesla is investing a lot in that. So, so we have a number of people who are on uh, watching right now. And if you have questions for uh, Dr. Schwartz, please put in the Q&A, the question or the chat, and I'll be happy to ask them. So, and, and there's nothing about AI that we can't ask you. Uh, uh, I, I want to dive a little bit into the investing side because you, um, you know, you, you have, you know, your career has been about investing and writing algorithms and doing it at Citadel. And uh, there's also one person on here uh, who is setting up a hedge fund who is looking at doing it with crypto with AI. Um, and I would love to get your impression because you said that you're unhappy with the current state of investment management, which I am too, by the way. Uh, and maybe one day I can show you my, my, my proprietary calculators and you can tell me what's right or wrong about them. Uh, uh, and what you like about them. But can you tell us a little bit about what you do at AI funds and, and how that is pioneering something new about asset management? Absolutely. So, so first I should say that AI has been a part of finance for a long time. So as you mentioned, Citadel, Renaissance Technologies, Two Sigma, there's a bunch of hedge funds which apply machine learning and AI to try to gain an edge and create an alpha in the markets. Typically, they do something called high frequency trading, meaning they, they trade very, very quickly. We're talking about milliseconds and they're able to get see a lot of patterns across many markets and, and, and using that generate uh, predictions that are very short term and are able to create uh, leverage. So they might know what price is, you know, is about to go down here. So I could trade it here and they're able to, to create alpha there. What I'm trying to do with AI, that, so that's the world of hedge funds and quant hedge funds. Uh, but that doesn't, that for most investors, that's not available. And, um, and most investors work with RAs. And a typical RA um, has a set of ETFs that they provide to their investors. And usually, um, the way I used to teach finance to MBA students, they would say, well, you look at the historical correlations between different assets and the historical returns, and you build um, uh, a market with sufficient frontier. And then you, based on your risk aversion, we pick a point in the efficient frontier. That's the portfolio you need to hold. And it's a static portfolio. And it's a portfolio that you don't rebalance very often, maybe once a year. And that's it. That's the best we can do. So that's the theory that we've been working on since the 1950s. Mark Woods got his Nobel Prize for a paper he wrote in 1952. And, um, and it's a fantastic theory. I, I love everything about it. I used to teach it. But I think there's a new paradigm coming. The new paradigm of what I'm trying to do with AI funds is the idea is that there is, it's a multi-period game. It's, a, it's like a game. Finance investing is like a game. Essentially, you have a board. The board is the economy. And what you're trying to figure out, the AI is trying to figure out, is where is the next move? Where is the market going next? Should I be investing in gold more or more in high tech and or more defensive? How should I be moving my portfolio around? So what we've done is we used AI to figure out first, where is the market going on a time scale of anywhere from one week to four weeks? So it's kind of like looking into the near future. Is the market more likely to go up, to go sideways, to go down? Okay. And then once we have a sense of where the market is likely to go, what are the best assets to own in that type of environment? So what is the best portfolio? So that's what we do with AI funds, essentially saying, let's the a let the AI figure out where the market is likely to go based on different signals and things it's seeing in the market based on macroeconomic picture and how it compares to history, the last 50 plus years of, of data. And, and try to make a prediction. And I won't get too technical on, on how it does it, but um, it tries to make a prediction about where the, the market is going. And then what are the best sets of assets to invest in out of the universe of, let's say, ETFs? What are the best ones to own right now this month? So that's what it. That's what the. Um, that's what we do with AI funds. That's we have great. a lot of different strategies. And those are offered to RAs, so to advisors, not directly to the public. So really, if you have an advisor, 
that you like working with, you can ask them to, to, to use these strategies. Well, I'm, I'm that advisor. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so I, I will be asking you about that. Uh, so I do have a question. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is from Alan, and uh, he wants to know, is AI is still coded by a person, kind of super Google? Do you see AI writing its own code and implementing it? So AI has gotten really good at writing code. Even ChatGPT, you can pretty much ask it to write code in many different languages and it could write it for you. Um, I think in the future, that's something that will have uh, AI that could potentially write its own code. Not right now, uh, but it, it's potential. Right now, the way the system, the way it works today, uh, it's responsive, meaning we have to say what we want, and then the AI gives us what we what we're asking for, uh, and and we ask it, hey, can you write some code for me? And then it gives you here's the code that you asked for, and then you might say, you know, you made an error here. Can you please fix that piece, or can you make it do this also? And it will rewrite it for for you. It can't come up with its own volition. Hey, I want to write. And they say, I want to. Again, it's not conscious. It's not sentient. It doesn't have a need to write code, right? But I could potentially see down the road as, as AI evolves that that could be the case. Um, and if that happens, then AI could, I mean, that's the case. That's the point probably where AI gains, you know, uh, sentience and it becomes a conscious being. But we're not there. We're pretty far away from that. We don't even know how to get there, to be honest. Another question uh, from John. How would you compare the primary strengths, weaknesses, and applicability of the top three chat box, open AI versus Google versus Microsoft? Okay, so open AI and Microsoft is the same. So uh, Microsoft has like an investment in open AI. They invested but now just recently another $10 billion. So they're using the chat GPT developed by open AI in Microsoft products. So really it's the same, it's the same chat GPT, same model. And then you have Google. Google just announced that they it just uh, opened up to the public. I'm on a waiting list to use it. Uh, and they're slowly letting people in. So uh, I haven't had a chance to play yet with Bard. I did see a demo of it where it wasn't that impressive, at least in the demo. But I'm sure But Google are really the smartest guys um, in, in AI. They've been working it for many, many years. So I wouldn't be surprised if they catch up to, to ChatGPT. And, and, and it's going to be a, a race between the two companies. And it's a race where you have to understand these, these systems are huge. I mean, we're talking like thousands of, 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 of processors and memory and data being processed and built. So these, they're called large um, language models for a reason because they're, they're very large. There, there are tens of millions of dollars of investment. But then you have hundreds of scientists working on this. So you can imagine this is a big project. So not something as, probably not something a small company would be able to do as effectively as a, as a large company, but there are a bunch of small companies trying as well. So uh, Bob has a question. Do you use AI to both predict where the market is headed on whatever time horizon, and then also use AI to make decisions, buying and selling or holding or doing nothing? Yeah, so, so what we do at AI Funds, there's, there's a few steps in the process. So, you, so the first step is um, processing lots of historical macroeconomic data to figure out what today is similar to in the past. We call it the microeconomic fingerprint. So we figure out, okay, there's never been a time like today, never been a time like this, but there's times in the past which have been more similar. We match those and then we build probability distribution of that. And from that, we can make a prediction, a Bayesian prediction about where um, the uh, where the market is going. And then we have an AI optimizer, which actually based on that prediction can figure out which assets to own and what the weights are. And that's what we actually provide to RAs, and they then trade on the behalf of their customers. So we provide that those portfolios, depending on the different strategies, risk aversion, and things like that. There's different strategies of how you know that depend that, that tell the AI what is the right, how much weight um, the AI wants to put in, you know, in, in let's say equities is based on the different strategies and how much risk aversion there is in them. So a more risk averse person will probably have less equities because those tend to be more volatile and a more risk seeking would have higher equities. But the actual percentages, that's determined by the AI. So, so there's a group called Risk Allies. Um, and and, and I, they're always out there marketing to me. And what I don't like about them is that they, they're constantly showing what 
you know, negative events that have occurred and then show what their portfolio would have done. So they're not predictive. They're looking backwards. And in, in all fairness, that's kind of all we can do is look backwards because we're not really good at predicting the future. How, how can you see or, you know, rationalize like what, you know, like today we had the Fed meeting and how, how do you forecast the 25 basis point rise versus 50 basis points? And, and, you know, because that does impact, you know, the short term moves in the market. Okay, so, so good, good, good question. So I can, the analogy I would give is the way an analyst, a human analyst would approach this problem. They would say, okay, let's look at where the macroeconomic variables are today. What's inflation? Where's inflation? Where are interest rates? How have interest rates moved recently? What about what's happening with the economy and so on? And then they'd go back to time and they might say, you know, today reminds me a lot, looks a lot like 1979. And let's look to see what happened in 1979 to the market. And they do this kind of, they show, well, back in 1979, this is what happened. And therefore, I think this is what's going to happen today. We do the same thing, but not just on one data point. We do it on all the data points. And then we do it scientifically, build a distribution based on all those times in the past. So if a human can do it on one point or maybe a couple, the machine, the AI, could do it on all of them. So we take all those dozens of times in the past, which one was sim more similar to today, and we try to figure out from those, from what happened in the past, what's likely to happen today. Now, it's not 100% because, again, even in the past, it was a distribution. Sometimes, you know, in the next uh, week, the market went up and sometimes it went down. But in those situations where the macro variables line up and it shows you that, you know, there's a high likelihood that the market is going to go down, that's where you want to take reduced risk. Because, you see, it's not 100% sure the market will fall or that, you, you know, but there's a high chance of that or higher than I would normally have based on all these past times when that happened. Therefore, I would want to reduce my risk. And that's essentially what our AI does. It, it figures out, it has a name, it's called BELA. It stands for Bayesian AI Learning Algorithm. And what BELA says is, you know, right now I'm seeing patterns that look a lot like times when the market fell. You might want to reduce your risk in the market. That's, that's an example of what it does. Well, I, I love that. I'm I'm going to be after this in the next couple of days. I'm going to be reaching out to you to learn more about this. Um, I I have a, an anonymous person who has a question. I wanted to hear Dr. Schwartz's thoughts on the fact that most of the prominent AI constructs have been developed by larger tech corporations and or engineers with their resources to implement these large scale learning developing concepts. In your opinion, what could the average retail investor consumer do to keep up? Well, I mean, I don't, I, to be, the, the reality is that the world of, um, okay, I will say it this way. That, that, that area of AI actually is very fertile. There's a lot of research being done by many, many, many entities, both in academia, as well as many startups. Some of them are very small and some are larger, like OpenAI is quite a large one. Um, so there's lots of different range of research and there are many, many different areas. If you think about it, like um, one area, for example, that AI has been around that you may not be aware of is, for example, credit rating. So deciding whether a person should be given a loan uh, uh, or, or whether uh, someone should be given uh, the ability to uh, um, uh, you know, pay for something using payments. All those things use a lot of data and information about where the person very quickly in the background. And the machine learning algorithm is dividing people into different risk levels. And then that's deciding the terms of the loan and other things. So that's being done today already. It's already been done for many years. Most people are not aware of that, but that's actually a machine learning problem that's been solved fairly well. Um, uh, you know, for an individual investor today, really, they're, they're, you know, if you want to tap into AI, there's different ways you can do it. One way you can actually invest in companies that, that, that do AI, and there's actually ETFs out there. That, that's, that they have AI as part of their mandate um, mm -hmm. and they invest in you know, uh, uh, cutting edge technologies, including AI, robotics, things of that nature. So you could invest directly in ETFs. Uh, if you want your portfolio to be run by AI, I'm not aware of other companies other than mine that, that do what we do, uh, but there, I'm sure it's coming. There are some people out there who do it more for uh, stocks where they will help you pick stocks. and might tell you, this is the stocks that RAI says are a good investment right now. Um, I, I think that's a, there's a huge potential there, but it's also super dangerous uh, because stocks have a lot of idiosyncratic risk, which means that you can have big surprises there. Uh, we prefer to do with ETFs because there you have, um, uh, you know, you're kind of making a, a bigger bet on a trend or direction 
of a sector of the economy or, or the economy in general. And I think that's something that there's a better chance of doing that well than, than picking individual stocks. I think that's hard. So um, Marcelo has a question. He says, Morgan Stanley is planning to use GBT4 to generate trade ideas for their bankers. How do you think these trade ideas would be? <laughs> well, I, 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 I haven't heard of that. The only way this would work, I mean, it, it, it could make sense as long as it's connected to real-time data. Today, the, the chat GPT that we're using today has been trained in data through 2021. So it doesn't know what's happened in the last two years. Uh, so you, first off, you have to have real-time data. And that's why there's a lot of problem also, because many times the, these models have hallucinations where they see facts that are not really real. They're making up things. Um, so it, it's it's uh, it, so it's it's a dangerous thing to to say I'm going to trade based on what the chat GPT. I think what they're saying is they're going to use it if they can feed it with real time data. They can they can ask it for ideas. Okay, given what you're seeing here and here, what do you think is the likelihood of this and that happening? Or maybe there's a so I can see that happening. But you still have the human in the loop here, where they're getting ideas and then they're doing their own analysis to figure out is this a good idea. So uh, what they're doing with the chat GPT, it sounds like, is opening the universe of potential ideas. So if uh, you know, if a normal investment team might have 10 ideas a week, they'll be able to get 100 ideas from ChatGPT. They might still just do one trade, but it opens up the ID universe. I haven't heard of this, but it makes sense to me that you could potentially have more, more of these trades. I, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's a, a lot of it depends on how the specifics of how they implement it. I, I would say that's that's something you, you'd have to drill down into. So, so uh, John has a question. He says that Elon Musk uh, warns about AI and what can and should be done to prevent catastrophe. Uh, Elon Musk seems to be everywhere, uh, and and you know he's thought of as being one of the smartest people you know on Earth. Uh, and I don't know what his knowledge is about AI, but uh, what is what is your thought about his warning about AI? First off, Elon Musk is a is is a brilliant guy and uh, and an amazing entrepreneur. Um, I, I first off, I I I think he's right. I think in the long and it all depends on the, on the horizon that you're looking. So if you're looking at AI over the next five years, uh, we don't have anything to worry about. Okay, we're far away from having a sentient AI that can do the things that Elon is work, uh, worried about. But you have to understand that Elon is working is thinking about completely different time scales than most people. He's thinking about colonizing Mars. And starting a human colony there, something, a process that could potentially take, you know, 50, 100 years into the future. So when he says he's worried about AI, he's talking about AI in a few decades from now. And, and he's right to worry, because if we don't put guardrails and we don't put things in place, um, uh, then that, then, then potentially dark outcome could happen. And it could potentially, there is, just like every technology um, that's very powerful, it has a lot of potential benefits for humanity humanity, but there's also potential uh, uh, bad things that could happen uh, that could hurt us. And we have to make sure to try to avoid those, uh, those, those downside outcomes. This is actually one of the reasons he started one of his companies called Neuralink. Neuralink, the whole idea came because of that potential downside where he said, you know, we're not going to be able to pick up to you know, keep up with AI in the future. And we're talking about in the far future, it's going to be way smarter than us, but we could potentially merge our intelligence with AI where humans and AI could actually have uh, a, a dialogue and could actually be able to, uh, this, AI could supplement us. This is more like a chip in your head, right? Isn't that neural? It, 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 the idea is to connect directly to your neural, to, to your brain through uh, uh, special connectors. They could, it's like a chip, yeah. Uh, and, and the idea is that eventually you'll be able to have complete communication from your brain to uh, an AI or machine. The, the beautiful thing about this company is that it has a lot of applications before that, for a lot, especially for people who are paraplegics and other people who are uh, who don't have complete access to their brain could potentially do that for them. So there's a lot of wonderful applications for this company um, in the near future. Um, but down the road, really, that was the vision for starting it, is to eventually be able to have humans uh, uh, com connect and combine with AI. And that's, that's Elon's idea of how to save the human race, because if AI is super smart, well, if AI is part of us, then we're super smart too. That's the idea. So, so I could sit and my wife could be sitting and we could talk to each other but without having to talk to each other. 
That's right. Oh. You'll, you'll be communicating at the speed of thought. <laughs> wow. Of thought. Yeah, yeah. No, that's and and I, I you know, it, it could, you know, you, there, there are movie, movies about this. This is like a dystopian future, you know, Matrix and so on. Uh, but there is there is uh, uh, the, the, there is also some potentially good outcomes in this direction. Uh, I could tell you this is still technology in the early stages, but it, the the potential to help people who who, who are paralyzed is is amazing, and that's going to have impact on many people's lives pretty pretty quickly. So. Uh... For those of you who are here, um, and if you're interested in asking uh, Dr. Schwartz a question, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so feel free to put into the Q&A um, your question, and I'll be certain to ask him. Uh, William had a question, and I'm not sure if you have a track record, but his question is, what is your track record? Do you have a track record? Yeah, I do, but I, I, I prefer not to say it in a public forum like this. Okay. I do right. have a track record. I'd be happy to show it to you, Ed, and, and share with you all the, you know, have tear sheets and all that. So I'd be happy to show all of that to you. Okay. I would I would love to get that in. William, I'll get that to you, um, you know, but keeping it very private. So I, I actually have a list. What One of the things I do is, and I have no problem saying it, I go on TikTok all the time. And I see all these quick little clips about AI, and and I've I've actually written down all the websites that attract me, that really get me interested. And and one of them was the ability through AI to make commercials or make videos. Are you aware of this technology with AI? I am aware of a lot of uh, technology with AI that helps creatives, people who create paintings and and, and photographs. Yes, create those um, and and be able to basically use words to describe something and have the AI create or picture in the style of whatever artist you want and so on. And I've heard something about the commercials as well of having AI. Um, and and there's many aspects of that, uh, starting with avatars that are like human like characters, uh, synthesizing voice, creating an AI yes. where you you make it you you record uh, I don't know whoever you want in, in the media. And then have him say whatever it is you want him to say, and it sounds just like that character. So you you can do a lot of things today with AI that are pretty remarkable, and uh, including commercials. But of course, then you have uh, ownership issues. You record someone famous, and you create an avatar that looks just like them, and you make him say something. They could potentially sue you for <laughs> because you you made you made them say something, and you never got the rights to that. So. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think that if it's done in the right way with the right legal structure, it's completely possible. I mean, it, it's just amazing. So um, Anonymous had another question. What is Dr. Schwartz's thoughts on the movie Ex Machina? Mm. Are you familiar with that movie? I am. I am familiar with that movie. Um, I think uh, I actually, you know, it's funny. It was on my to-do list to read and I, to see, and I never got around to it. So I can't talk specifically on that movie. I know in general what it's about, um, and my my thought is that that's that's actually um, at least the idea of humans falling in love with with a robot uh, or a chat GPT. That's not that far away, um, and in fact, even today, people are already using um, chat GPTs and other chatbots as as a way to. Um, I guess you could say therapy is a way to communicate and share emotions and, and be able to do that. Uh, there was actually a recently an article, not a few, uh, a few weeks ago uh, by a New York Times writer who actually got ChatGPT to say things that are outside of its guardrails where essentially it, it professed, uh, ChatGPT professed its love uh, to this writer and even asked him in the article, he writes about this, uh, asked him to leave his wife for, for it. So. Uh, complete crazy hallucination stuff. Um, but it was, again, it was, um, uh, uh, again, one of these hallucinations that these chatbots can have. So one of the things, and it claimed its love for the writer and so on. And, and obviously this is, again, this is not sentient. It's not conscious. It's just saying things that it processing and creating this text. They could fool you into believing that it's a sentient being. We actually have a term for this in, in, the, in AI. It's called something called the Turing test where the idea is if you can you talk to a machine and if it, you think you're talking to a human, um, then it's passed the Turing test. And actually ChatGPT is, 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 has passed it. For a lot of people, they think they're talking to a real sentient being. So, um, so I think that it's, uh, uh, we're in a place now 
uh, where something like that, like in the movie, where there could be a, you know, a love affair between a machine and a human, that is possible and not far-fetched. And I can totally imagine a startup taking ChatGPT as the basis and then modifying it to be a virtual, you know, uh, lover for for people, <laughs> and you could you can uh, you know but you could have someone you love who's virtual, and it's a character that's been created for you. It's not real, you know, it's not real, but maybe it fills a void that you have in your in your life. And I think that's something that's uh, could happen in the near future. Oh my goodness! There's yeah, so I know. It, it, and it's not about that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty out there, right? But it's it's completely possible. It is no, and and you'd have. Uh, and, and it might be a subscription service where, <laughs> you know, uh, where people would, would pay for that. I wouldn't be surprised. So, so Bruce uh, made a comment. It says there's a big application that they're exploring for entertainment content delivery and for senior citizens impact. Um, so I, you know, again, the, the limits are boundless. Um, people are looking for other people to talk to. Right. If a senior person is trying, you know, always wants to talk to their grandkids if they have them and so on um, and their kids. And, and maybe this could fill some of that void. Um, you know, you're alone most of the day and all of a sudden you have something you can converse with. It can fill your time and can you can tell your thoughts and feelings to and can help you uh, work your way through that. I mean, that's really the part of what therapy is about. So I could totally see that being a big uh, uh, um you know, it's not going to replace a therapist, but it's going to could potentially replace a, a piece of that. Well, it must be nice to know that something that you started looking into, you know, many, many years ago, uh, like it kind of feels like, you know, all the wind is at your set, you know, at your back and it's, it's all coming to what, you know, you're, you're an expert at. And, um, and I, I greatly appreciate you taking the time uh, today. Uh, you're, you're a wonderful person, a wonderful man. And, and I, I look forward to talking to you offline about what you do and how I can implement that in my practice. Sure, be happy to. And thank you for all those compliments. All I want to say is that it seems, you know, people think, wow, it's here, it's live. We're still in the early stages. We're still early in the whole journey. AI is just now starting. And it's really, you have to think of this really as a multi-decade, a long journey for humanity with AI as being a part of us uh, for this long period of time. And it's only, it's, in my opinion, it's going to make the quality of life uh, for everyone on planet Earth much better. And that's really, uh, it's just like any other big invention. It's going to improve quality of life for all of us. Great. And I'm excited for this future. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time today. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.